So apologies, ladies and gentlemen. I just received word that the GLC, the Global Learning Council uh, members, are still having their working lunch meeting. So they're running slightly behind schedule, not at fault. I think it's the restaurant's fault. They're up here on the fifth floor. So we'll start once they join us after the meeting, right? So that would be just in a few minutes time. So let's just sit back and relax and start as soon as they join us. Thank you.
Test mic. Okay, I hope we all enjoyed lunch and also the technology demonstrations. So when I was in one of the rooms um, just before coming back here, I saw Dr. Earl Lim telling somebody who was wearing the ocular uh, rift instrument, catch the dog, catch the dog. Well, uh, what was happening was there was a little park running and the person with the oculus rift was visualizing the dog and the goal of that game is to net the little park right catch the dog catch the dog so anyway it was interesting and i didn't know what was happening when somebody was shouting catch the dog catch the dog okay we'll, we've come back for the afternoon session and we begin this afternoon with a lecture by professor ranga krishnan first of all may i invite our nus vice provost professor bernard tan to introduce prof krishnan so prof tan please Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome back after lunch. Our next speaker, Dr. Ranga Krishnan, is the Dean of the Rush Medical College and Senior Vice President of Rush University Medical Centre. He is an innovative medical educator, a productive investigator, and a world-renowned leader in psychiatric care and research. Dr. Krishnan was previously Dean at the Duke NUS Graduate Medical School. Under his leadership, Duke NUS established an innovative learning program for medical students called Team Lead that has been widely recognized and adapted in other institutions. Prior to this, Dr. Krishnan was professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at Duke University Medical Center. He was chairman of psychiatry at Duke from 1998 to 2009 at Duke, he created a translational research center focused on depression in the elderly. He is an elected member of the Institute of Medicine, the world's foremost national resource for independent, scientifically informed analysis and recommendations on human health issues. Dr. Krishnan has been the recipient of many awards and honors. He serves on the editorial boards of a number of scientific journals. He has authored more than 400 peer-reviewed papers, written two books on innovative approaches to medical education, and also written a well-regarded commentary series in the Today newspaper in Singapore. He is chairman of the National Medical Research Council, Ministry of Singapore. For his service to Singapore, he was awarded the Public Service Medal Friend of Singapore. And based on my conversation with uh, Dr. Krishnan, I can confidently tell you that he's extremely knowledgeable about this subject matter on learning science. And I can confidently tell you that he will be able to answer all your questions on this topic, <laughs> whatever those may be. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Krishnan, please. That's what I call a setup. <laughs> <laughs> so
So as long as I don't fall asleep uh, when I'm talking to you, I think I'm doing fine. Uh, what I'm hoping to do is sort of give you a, essentially a fly through on the, what is learning, how we are set up to learn, and a specific question that uh, the president of NUS asked me is repeatedly, are Asian learners different? So I'm gonna try addressing this in a general sense. Some of what I'm gonna say if you have uh, questions about it, please feel free to ask and I'll elaborate in more detail. Part of the reason for saying this is I, let's start with that. This is absolutely the wrong way to learn. And I can also say whatever I say now, you're not going to remember it after you leave the place. So I'm very comfortable saying anything that is totally wrong and false. Okay, I'm just going to start with uh, what was probably covered by uh, Chepong, uh, earlier on, one of the things that we always talk about learning is we make it somehow feel like it is connected to school, it is connected to university. Learning happens all the time. We, as animals, humans, etc., are born to learn. That's the first fundamental principle. You are learning all the time. It's what you learn which is the key that you're talking about. And one of the things that we emphasize often is technical learning, which is taking content and pouring the content into the brain of the other individual. That is what teaching ends up being. It isn't really learning, by the way, and you all know this, but we all do it. So a couple of things about non-technical skills. The reason I'm mentioning this is technical skills can gradually be, and I actually would presume, be built over time by systems <coughs> non-technical skills will take some time to build, totally. So some of those are literacy, numeracy, problem solving, these are the OECD things. But things that are particularly very valuable but not emphasized enough in the real world is interpersonal teamwork, communication, lifelong learning, and self-management. Now one thing I want to say is every one of these concepts, literacy, numeracy, problem solving, has got some specific aspects to it based on cognition. It isn't what you think. Numeracy is not just math. It is not just the technical solving of mathematical things. It is the ability to use, access, interpret, and equally important, communicate mathematical information and ideas in order to engage in man and manage the demands of society and actually situations in adult life. By the way, the human brain is not specifically built for this. So that's one of the reasons why you don't really remember things which are purely numerical without an effort. However, the human brain is built for narratives and stories, and narratives and stories are remembered. Interestingly, the narrative or story is not constant. It changes all the time. What you remember today is not what you remembered yesterday, and our brains are built that way. And there is a reason, it's built for survival. Now teamwork is not as easy as we think it is when you're in the workplace, this is one of the biggest issues. You have people coming in and they have to form teams and these teams form, assemble, disappear and reform. And usually this is where you run into problems in the workplace. It is a core skill for the labor market. And there are ways to do team building, the earlier the better. And about roughly 5% of the population will have some difficulty because team building requires not just communication, but emotional connectivity and communication. And emotional connectivity and communication has one key element in it called the ability to understand the emotion of the person you're talking to. So in other words, being able to engage requires emotional understanding. Emotional understanding is not there for a small percentage of the population, and when they don't have it, we call it alexithymia. They are particularly problematic to deal with, and we actually don't have very good modalities for improving it. Communication is more than the ability to talk. We always talk about this. What I'm doing now is not communicating, I'm talking, okay? What I would need to communicate is to hear from you, and I can talk with you or converse with you. It is engagement that is the key, and that is the ability to listen. This is a core <coughs> skill that is usually talked about, talked about in management courses, but is not seen as a fundamental skill that probably needs to start in the school, not later in life. 
It gets harder because if you don't organize yourself in this format and you're not naturally inclined to do so, it is a problem. This also gets back to another concept, which is all, one of the things I want to avoid during this presentation is to avoid using terms that psychologists and psychiatrists and neuroscientists use, because those terms, we love building them and throwing them out, but it doesn't communicate a thing. It just communicates that we know how to create new words. But that's about it. But these skill sets that we talk about are core skill sets, and it requires, to a certain extent, the ability to know how to do it and the ability to engage to do it. And it's something that I do think um, schools and universities, I would not say fail, but have generally not emphasized that You don't grade these things. You don't grade, you don't get what you want because you've set up systems to not do it. Now, one of the things I was trying to figure out, uh, courtesy of the president of NUS, is to ask the question, what do we really know about Asian perspective? The one thing all these tests, in many of them. However, not all, and many of these get connected to improving those scores. So in other words, the focus is those scores. The focus is not the rest of it, necessarily. And you all know these things. By the way, this is not just an Asian thing. I can just substitute Asia with anything you want, and it'll be the same issues. Now, one other word. How many of you have heard this word, hutagogy? Let me try to engage you a bit. How many of you have heard the word, hutagogy? Anybody else? And all of you are in the education field. <laughs> Pedagogy is teaching kids. Hutagogy is lifelong learning. It is not the same, not exactly the same, but it has the same core principles. Keep that in mind. Um, and what you're really talking about is for lifelong learning is to make it inquisitive, creative, self-directed learning. And that actually connects up to what uh, the previous speaker was talking about. So general incentives, by the way, do not work for these things. Specific incentives do. And that was part of the conversation. I'm not sure if you mentioned it, but it was part of the conversation yesterday that we were having with them. Now, one of the most important elements for any learning is motivation. No motivation, no learning. And by the way, this room is broad. If you look at your vision, you can actually, you are looking at me, hopefully. At some point, your mind will drift. Whatever I need to communicate, which I want to in the first five minutes, you will not have any idea what I talked about. So I'm very comfortable with that. <laughs> Whatever I say in the last five minutes, you're also likely to remember a bit of it, but not everything. Now, motivation is at the heart of learning. If somebody doesn't want to learn something, they are not going to learn. And motivation, I try to make it this way. Motivation has four elements built into it. You need to have some ability in whatever you're trying to learn. That is aptitude, whatever. Because it reinforces why you continue to engage in that particular thing. Second, especially when the motivation is extrinsically derived. Intrinsic motivation is, by the way, what a child or a baby has. It is built to learn and uses the learning all the time. Because it's building its knowledge of what the world around it is. And that's important. But somewhere along, we very quickly suppress it by directing it to what you want the baby to learn. It's a directed learning that comes in. If the interest is there, it learns, or if it's trying to please you, the baby learns. Benefit is therefore an important component, and the benefit is one of the things we'll talk about amongst Asian learners. Third thing which we really don't talk about enough in the general discussion of learning and education is confidence. If you don't have confidence that you can learn something, your ability to learn something is not as good as it can be. You would lose that pretty quickly. The last one, which is also a component attached to motivation, I'm using it separately, is the desire. At some point, even if you have A, B, and C, if you don't have the desire, it fades out. So all of you have students, if they don't have motivation in what they came into, or if the motivation was extrinsic but wasn't reinforced, at some point, it tends to disappear. This can be an entire discussion, and I'm just giving you a very short introduction to it. There's one comp there are two aspects to it, intrinsic and extrinsic motivation. <coughs> intrinsic is, in theory, the desirable motivation, creative, curio curiosity-driven, and natural. Extrinsic motivation is what you can develop as a way to build 
people to continue to engage and learn. So extrinsic is what people most often discuss. Intrinsic is the desire. So motivation, by the way, has a cultural context. And this is where I do think we don't think enough about it. Asian students, this is an Australian study, basically showed that Asian students were more motivated. One of the reasons for it is social factors. Social approval or motivation is stronger in Asians. This is Australian study. But the competitive motivation, I want to do as good as the next person, is the same. It's the social motivation which is different. Social motivation has a specific component in it which has been studied. It's family motivation, and family motivation plays a role in persistence, collectivistic learning, and often it's connected to the obligation, duty, tradition, and obedience, things that people are very familiar with in the Asian cultural context. In Western, it was more individualistic, self-reliance, curiosity-driven, solitude. By the way, I make it look like it is totally distinct. It isn't. It's a whole range. It is just that when you run studies, and by the way, some of these studies are large enough that you can say, yes, there are group differences, but it doesn't mean that an individual who's Asian can be the same as a Western or the other way around. So just keep that in mind. And I just have a reference for that because actually an interesting study if you want to look it up. So the learning process, I want to start off by saying what the brain is not. The brain is not a computer with storage. It definitely is not. It's not a recorder of events. It doesn't record anything. It pieces it together and rebuilds what it hears, sees, feels, thinks. The most important aspect of it is it does not have a delete function. You can't erase things. It's there. You just keep modifying on top of it. If you actually think of your own learning, you will see it as a modified form each time. It is originally built to navigate and survive, and it is a very selective storehouse. Okay? It doesn't store everything. It only stores selectively. And you know that we know some of the components of story. Just think of now. There is an air conditioning noise somewhere in the back, and you can hear the sound of the, um, I think it's a cooler for the uh, projector. But in your mind and consciousness, you're not aware of it most of the time. If you are aware of it, you're totally bored, and I'm putting you to sleep. <laughs> Most of the sensory events do not reach even consciousness. You're not even aware of it. Only a few of them are turned into observations, and even fewer are retained. And it's a very good thing. Imagine you're hearing all these sounds, and you're retaining it like a recorder. You cannot function. You cannot think. You cannot feel. You cannot function. And you can see it in everyday events. I'm not going to go into great detail, but you will see it all the time. Our brains and the brains of all organisms are built this way. So the key component is attention that drives what you want to focus on. So the learning process has many components in it, but they're all pulled together. It's very hard to disassemble them. They start in many ways with attention. Perception meaning you attend, but what you interpret is based on your own previous experience, belief system, etc. And by the way, some of it is hardwired, some of it is softwired and malleable. Memory, it's actually a loaded term, but I'm going to keep it without getting into an in-depth discussion of what memory is. Internal thoughts, well, actually when I'm talking, it's not like you're not thinking. You're probably thinking of what you got to do, where you were, the food was terrible, the food was good, whatever. You will have those thoughts crisscrossing. And learning as a whole includes all those elements. And the main question is, what leads some information to be stored and others? I'm speaking. You can see me. You can put a picture of me and my voice talking. But actually, I can be mouthing, and there could be a speaker. And you can really think I'm saying something I'm not. And by the way, each of you is interpreting what I'm saying differently. You're not actually saying what, hearing what I think I'm saying. So this is a key element. You are hearing this all the time. So perceptions are sway mostly swayed by prior knowledge and prior belief systems. It also is swayed by how our human brain were built for survival. So there are certain, and I'm again not going to get into depth, even very simple vision is a perception. Very, very simple vision. Forget about more complex things. It's all perception. And by the way, the technical term that people want to use is top-down processing. Bottom-up input, top-down processing. So if you actually start looking at the fundamental elements of it, all humans are the same. 
when you start looking at it at higher levels of cognition, people have started to say that those whose focus in Asians, and by the way, I, I don't like these terms, but this is the data that is out there, is tendency to be more holistic, there is attention paid to the field as a whole. However, if I look at it as specific vision, specifically very narrow focused things, there's no difference. All humans perceive the same way. It is what, when you're open, you look at things in a different dimension because your cultural context and your background is different. Your top-down processing infers differently. Now, one thing which is actually interesting is many of these studies show something called control and object focused, and that is believed to be greater amongst those with and background. Again, I don't like it because you can actually take a person whose ethnicity is X but lives in a different context, and it's quite different. Okay, just, I'm trying to go through this in a pretty fast space scale, so if you don't remember, it's perfectly normal. <laughs> so memories are the inner histories that we store and maintain, and by the way, even autobiographical memory of you yourself and what you did is not what it is. It is what you infer what it is. Okay, and it will change. If I ask you tomorrow, you will not be able to repeat exactly what is happening now. The first stage in every memory is encoding. It's a computer terminology in a way, but it actually is a link of encoding is putting things roughly into a file cabinet. Anyway, the second stage in this is making it more permanent. It never is totally permanent. It is constantly being modified. And the last part is extracting it in the appropriate time and using it to perceive the next thing, which in turn modifies it. It's being constantly changed and modified. It sounds very simple. It isn't. And so really what's going on is we're getting a lot of things. You focus on a few things. Some of it you keep and some you don't. What drives it is what we talked about in the beginning. Motivation, ability, benefit, confidence, desire. And actually a couple more things. If anything is emotional, you tend to remember better than anything that's flat, non-emotional. Anything that is number, you don't remember as well. Anything that has got a story or a how you can use what we know to learn, right? Our brains are therefore not video recorders. They don't store information as is. This always comes up, rote and repetitive learning, okay? All learning for it to be there long is repetitive. Have to repeat things to keep it in the brain, why? Your survival means you have to know what is very common so that it doesn't surprise you and you know how to deal with it. Rote learning is when you learn without understanding. And by the way, this is a definitional issue. If you take rote learning as learning without understanding, then you differentiate it from repetitive learning. The two terms, by the way, are used interchangeably very often. If you want to use it differently, rote versus repetitive is different. And by the way, student strategies, when you actually test them, are different. You can show students who come out of a particular cultural background have used more rote learning before they start applied learning. Others start with applied learning, curiosity driven, and then use rote strategies to keep it longer. So you can have it both ways. And there is data backing it up uh, from the useric.edu website. Now this comes up all the time, and again, I'm not gonna get into great detail, but creativity is an issue, and you hear it in Singapore a fair amount. Uh, you hear it everywhere. And I actually like it when people throw it around all the time, because I'm not sure people fully understand what they're throwing around. So creativity is culture dependent, by the way. So there is a cultural context to it, because what the culture values is what is gonna drive the benefit, the desire, the motivation. The ways to acquire the knowledge and skills can therefore d differ from one culture to another. In certain ways, those of you who have studied the Prussian system of education, which is now the Asian system of education in many countries, rewarded re repeating things that you're supposed to know and repeat it exactly the same way. Okay? When you reward what you want, you get what you want. You don't get what you now want, not what you try to get them to do. So this is something to think about because cultures, and culture, by the way, is nothing but a set of behaviors in the society as a whole. So whenever people say culture and strategy and one beats the other, it also gets into the inference component, which do you, what drives it? How do you set up the drive system to change? So this gets to we get what we want, and that is the bottom line for this part of the discussion. You can build systems and you can get what you want by building those systems. What you can't do is build one and want another thing. 
which is often what happens. Okay, now getting into some of the key elements. This is things that you can study in honeybees. Honeybees are great learning organisms. They can't survive without learning. And, by, and this is actually true for a lot of other insects. In, so what I'm saying is it doesn't matter whether you're insect or whether you're human. Some elements of this are the same. Whether you're learning emotions, you're learning skills, you're learning whatever, it has the same basic principles attached to it. The learning curve is essentially the rate of learning, or whatever you're learning. And the curves for learning can be different for different things. Why is it different? Very difficult to say based on our knowledge at this point in time. Can we predict it? Some extent. Numeracy can be predicted to some extent by early testing that people have developed. A lot of this work is from France. Uh, the question that is there is could you change that learning curve for math? And the answer so far is seems to be quite difficult. So there is an interesting element to that. Requires more work. And if you want, you should bring him down to give you a talk on it because he's actually done an enormous amount of work in this area. The learning curve is also different for different individuals. It's a so-called aptitude testing. Different for subjects and different for different individuals. But the, what is equally striking is a forgetting curve. This is very constant. This tends to be there across every species that you want to study. And remember why the forgetting curve is important? It is important because if you remembered everything, you are not surviving. Forgetting curve is an essential function. And the forgetting curve has this characteristic with the minor variations. This has been known for 100, 100 plus years. It's one of the basic principles of memory forgetting curve. Now what has happened is technology has changed things. Our memory has become no longer the memory inside our head. It's a memory that we can search and make decisions on. So that memory and the cloud can store enormous quantities of information. More important, it has digested and digestible and non-digested information in it. How you search, the search tools present the information, becomes a de facto accessible knowledge base. And you can tell the search engine sort of predicts this is what you're looking for. Even before you're 100% certain, it takes you there. To some extent, Google and others are trying to reverse engineer some of it, but it is interesting. If you start the pattern, your brain wants to look for the same things. It is a reinforcement component, which is not just a technology issue. It is not just an interface issue. It is how our brains are designed. We've got to figure out how do you design things such a way that you want to avoid some of it. So this is, by the way, no different from how we search our own memories. We don't search our memories any different. It is very hard for you to remember things that you don't want to remember. Just think of your conversation with your own families or their conversations with you. I do it all the time, so you do it too. Okay, so this brings up Sherlock Holmes. He's my favorite character. Memory of everything, internal to us or extensible memory, is a full attic. It's got lots of things in it. So what we need to know is how to find the right information at the right time and place, a skill that is quite different and not as intuitive as what we're accustomed to. There's another component to it, perception drives this. Could we change perception? Could you look at things a lot differently? Could you train your mind to look for things in such a way that you discover anomalies a lot more than you expect to do so? Okay, and this brings up the concept of critical thinking. I'm not gonna get into great detail, I'm just trying to give you little pieces that can, you can explore. By the way, you're gonna learn by exploring. You're not gonna learn anything from what I'm saying. First, we all learning. We learn by attending to what we learn. So motivation and interest become the key. So a big component of anything that you want people to learn. By the way, look at how strongly I'm trying to avoid the word teaching. Okay, because it has a different connotation. Second, for memory to be formed and stored long term, equally important, repeated practice is the essential element. I assume many of you know space versus mass learning. If you don't, a one second introduction to it. If you want to learn quickly and forget very quickly, learn all at one time, which is what you do for exams. So exams by its very design is designed to make you not learn anything for the long term. It is helped to design to get you through an exam. If you want to learn and remember things for the very long time, the spacing has to be very, very long. The longer the spacing interval, the longer the retention. However, it can't be so long that you don't remember anything that you learned, okay? So the issue there is can you derive a learning 
space learning curve. And there are some obsessive people who have done the work, and I'll give you that in a second. So learning is faster, by the way, when you learn one skill at a time, but you actually remember better and retain better if you learn skills interspersed or preferably. It's called mixed learning. And this is actually what you do in day-to-day -day life. You remember things when it is part of a whole experience rather than learning one thing at a time. But it's easier to learn one thing at a time for the short term, not for the long term. And the reason for it is actually how the brain works. The brain works by this kind of system, and it is actually called desirable difficulty. And it's a term very well worth thinking about. Interesting study. If you change the font size of what you want to study, give for your students to study, make it very small, and change the font to something they're not used to, they remember better than if you make it large, beautiful, great to read. Exactly the opposite of what technology and visual aids do. Reason, it's called the illusion of knowing. Your brain looks at it and says, ah, this is easy. It's gone. The difficulty comes because you're focused, brings your attention in. Rule number one, I'm just going to go through a single set of rules, how to motivate. The key things we know about all motivation things are goals are to be set, but they have to have an ABC. Achievable, believable, clear, and concise. You need to organize to meet goals. I'm not going to get into this. Studying and restudying. They read it again. You again get into the illusion of knowing. It is far better, and this you can test on yourself. You close your book, recall, works far better. And this goes to the illusion of knowing. We talked about space you're learning, but I just want to say the right spacing interval from a large study of 1,000 plus people in uh, Florida suggests that if you know when you need to remember, your test is one year from now, or lifelong. Lifelong is different, but if your test is X period from now, your repetition of something that is difficult for you to learn, that is not one that your aptitude is not as good, is 10% intervals. And by the way, the better you know, the longer the intervals. So you can space it out more. 30% intervals for those that are more difficult subjects. I'm sorry, more easy subjects. So it just gives you an example. Mixing it up is what I just said. Rule, you try not to focus one thing at a time. And this has been done in math repeatedly. And the reason is your brain starts doing one thing at a time. But when you now see it in a different context, you're not able to pull together what you need to do. So if you're learning math, and this is where it's been best studied, which also you can try it for other things. Take what you already did before, intersperse it with your, what you're learning now. And that interspersal makes you decide which, te which do you need to use when. Early is clear. The interesting thing is when you do a math textbooks, are in, I don't know if they've changed. I think they are starting to change. If you just do the same thing over and over, you get very good at doing it over and over. But when you have to use it in the real world, it doesn't work, which is what you're really trying to do. So this ends up being something we know, but we actually do it the exact same way. The rule number seven is generally when you, it works better. If you're not trying to remember it word to word or verbatim or the concept, but you're trying to understand. And there's a whole range of things that you can facilitate learning with understanding. So the knowledge cycle requires whatever you have pre-existing plays a role in depth. If I learn something, can I connect it to something else in my own experience? If you start doing that, it retains information longer because it is sticking to something already stored better. And by the way, almost all learning tends to have a fa factor in this, more robust learning. Most of these things that I'm suggesting have randomized studies behind it, not all. Most, but not all. This is data from medical schools. And you can see it nowadays, most of the audiences, like if I was doing this to a medical school audience, if I had five kids in the room, I would be happy. The rest of them are home doing the right thing. The five kids are doing the wrong thing. <laughs> Forgetting, this is Ebbinghaus, and this is the classic curve I talked about. Now Bob and Sandy, and they're somewhere in the room, right there, played a role in taking many, not all, many of these elements into building an approach when we started a brand new school and taking it also from work that was done in the US and pulled it together to create a structure which is learn, engage, apply, and develop. Uh, you can create content in any way, but one of the interesting things about content is if it's linear content, which is the way lectures are, people drift because whenever you don't really, you already know something, your mind drifts off. Whereas editable, annotable, and those that you can pick allows you to learn faster. Second thing which we learned, is if you actually watch students learning, if you have a 
thing that lets you speed up the voice, they will speed it up to at least 1.5 times because the one-time rate of speaking is too slow. You can actually go faster, and people do. Some do it at two, two and a half times. Unfortunately, my brain doesn't process. Um, and we've tried to build systems to do this. This is for the medical school. And these are slides that Bob, as uh, Dr. Kame and Dr. Cook use all the time. This is what we actually do, wishful thinking. We're very great at doing this, by the way. All of us are wishful thinking because we believe in what we do. If we don't, we really wouldn't be doing it, right? So this wishful thinking is how we do it. Almost every school everywhere does this. And I wonder how much money and effort goes into it. Makes us feel good, but that's a good thing. So gender is active learning. You give them homework, and then at some point you're testing them with an exam. The reality is nobody reads much before they come. They come here, they may be thinking of doing something else, and today with Facebook and everything else, very much, and this is what you want them to do, and what you really do is this, just before the exam, exactly the opposite of what learning is all about. So this is a traditional reality, and Dr. Kame and Dr. Cook essentially said, oh, we really want you to work because we're going to test you. A little bit of motivation there. Not the perfect motivation. Hopefully they got enough motivation to come to medical school. So the content is produced beforehand. You can watch it. If you don't like it, watch something else to learn the same topic. And when you come in, the first thing you do is we see if did you learn, and can you work in a team to learn more. And we'll show it to you in a second. And this is the approach. This is how the classroom at Duke looks like. And they walk in, there's a timer in the screen, and the questions turn up. And you have a little clicker, you answer, and the faculty knows, did you have a party last night? Did you learn, etc., Or was the topic difficult for everybody? And then you actually work in groups. This is interesting. This, there is a fair amount of data that you learn better when you learn with friends than if you learn from somebody who's not your friend. Not totally true. Somebody who you think, and if you ask the dumb question, you're not going to learn. Whereas with your friends, it's a lot easier. Peer learning was started a lot with nursing schools, and it is one of the more effective forms of learning when you're able to engage with your peers. So same test is then taken together as a group. This is the scratch off forms. The more you scratch off, the lower your grade. And all you need is somebody who do doesn't have to know the content. He just needs to know how to facilitate it. So basically, the hard work here is knowing what you want them to know. And that is the hardest thing to do. And then really what you want them to do later is for it to retain, is to take what they learned and apply it, which is done after a short break. So we built this uh, at Duke NUS. And by the way, when this whole thing was started, there was enormous skepticism. The first one was students in Asia won't ask questions. I think Dr. Kame and Dr. Cook found it difficult to get them out of the room because they kept asking questions. So you actually had to have a timer. Many of the things we believe are probably not true. It is what we choose to believe that plays a role in making it real. And by the way, this has now been adopted. So it's not just an Asian thing. It's been adopted back at Duke, not just for medical school and for other things. But this is something I don't want to get into great detail. But if you really want to do real learning, questions is the way to learn. If you get to know how to ask questions and keep asking it, you learn. Because today, the information, the content is available in some form or another. You need to know how to ask the question. You need to know where to find the answer to the question. And you need to use your brain before you believe the answer to the question, which the third part is the hardest one. Because we tend what somebody says, especially if it's somebody we respect, which may or may not be true. And by the way, this is not something that you can just do in a medical school. Uh, the Ministry of Education here was very supportive, and we tried it out uh, in a couple, I don't know how many schools now, but a couple of schools with kids who have a little more difficulty with learning and basically found you can adapt it into a school system. And why? Because the brain works the same way. Okay, we all learn the same way. We all have to repeat those principles. I talked a few more. But the main ones are the ones that I talked about. So when it finally comes down to technology and enhanced learning, if you build technology for the sake of technology, it's great. We can feel good. We can have a good belief system. And I see a lot of it. I see people trying to sell me things all the time. Unfortunately, I'm a skeptic. So you want to sell me something, show me. And I like data. 
And that, I find, is not an easy one to get answers on. And the reason for it is so much variability in the learning curves. People actually don't test learning curves. They learn, you can either look at content or application. Very hard to build test learning. The hardest thing is the questions lecture, which is what I'm doing. So thank you for the opportunity to give you all a lecture. Thank you very much, Prof Krishnan. So as we heard Prof Krishnan saying, question, question, question. That's the best way to learn. So he's asking us to ask him questions. So let's ask questions on Pigeon Hall as well as from the microphone. And I will invite um, our Associate Provost, Professor Bernard Tan, to uh, moderate the discussion. So, Prof. Bennett Tan and Prof. Ranga. So, fire away, questions. Yes, please. Yeah, I wonder if you could say a little bit more about that very last thing you said, which is, how do you actually make the right kinds of assessments of outcomes, and maybe also, how do you know those outcomes are actually what should be the right targets as opposed to what's been in textbooks for a long time? I think those two are really interesting pieces. So the person who's next to you can answer that better. This is a way of getting people engaged. Sandy, or Bo I don't want them to fall asleep by this. <laughs> <laughs> but you're asking the right question. And the question is, how do you know they got what you want them to know? I'm sorry to put you on the spot, but... No, you're not. <laughs> um, from an education perspective, it's, it's really around building the right objectives and, and asking the question of what you want them to look like at the end. And when you build that objective effectively, it builds into the assessment of how you will know whether or not you've achieved that in, in the first place. So really design and and so that is uh, half of the battle is really thinking carefully about what it is that you want to achieve and then what are the strategies that will help you determine whether or not they've achieved that so I'll pitch in um, that's a really tough content is the easiest part that uh, one of the things that we first did when we um, did our pedagogical approaches did we hurt the learner in any way um, in terms of doing all these other types of things in terms of teamwork and, and, uh, and actually application. And, and Ranga didn't explain, but the application of knowledge to clinical problems that we teach with the open book. So people were, they read on the internet, right? So people were saying, well, were the students gonna learn this way because it's a lot of your, your, your process was actually open book. And so we were able to show pretty convincingly and with very steady uh, data that the students learned very well and, in fact, we thought better. We have a problem in medical school because of the ceiling effect, that it's hard to show real differences, but we didn't, certainly didn't hurt the students. But then it really, besides the content, because that's really the challenges. So, we, for instance, we put together our program so that we wanted our students to start to learn in teams and have that because we knew that teamwork is important for the practice of medicine. Disasters in medicine occurred because of poor teamwork. So could we start to teach that? So it's, but it's very messy because uh, it's been hard for us to show does the teamwork that we sh see in the classroom translate out to the wards? Okay, so that's very, very hard because it's so many things going on. So there's other things that we see. Um, um, I think uh, one of the things I was thinking about was they're in classroom and team lead. Um, they're only in classroom um, twice a week. So, so most of the time they're not in the classroom with, with the professor. And they're in for maybe five or six hours in that day in the classroom. But no one ever sleeps. It's impossible to sleep. So in terms of engagement, if you think that's a proxy for learning, we certainly have that. So there's other things that we're trying to measure. Um, I think that some of these things won't, we won't be able to get to until we start to have large data uh, longitudinally over time. Um, the simple thing is the content, and, and I could assure you our students do very well. But the other things which I consider actually more important than the content, those are harder, been harder for us to show. Did, did that answer your question? Okay. Thank you. 
Andy, uh, there is a very good question on uh, pigeonhole with uh, 13 votes, so let's look at this one. Yeah, given the importance of the forgetting curve, how do we deal with the pervasive externalization of memory through... Uh, it's actually a very interesting question because it's already done that yeah. to some extent. Think of all the things that you use where before you'd have had to ask somebody to go read and understand more. The more the pre information is pre-digested and given to you, and you see it in medicine, you see it as evidence-based medicine, et cetera, that it does make you not question. So the big thing is get you to continue to keep questioning. And one of the interesting things is any time you actually have a, it's a little shorter, it's a fleeting thing. And the reason actually is interesting. Visual memory is processed and kept longer. So we were built that way again. So you're actually bringing up something, right? How many of you remember phone numbers? And you do, that's great. But one out of, I don't know, maybe a few. The reason there is it's taken away, as you said, the extensive, you, you got a memory storage out there. How many of you actually remember what you're doing appointment-wise? Everything, it is good. But if you start extending it to every facet, and you are seeing it, it actually plays a role in bias formation, influences bias, influences opinions, influences, I think, elections very, very well without your knowing it is doing it. And say we're in it. Collectively, I'm not sure how you change it because our educational systems were built for an era that has ended. It is not built for an era that it's going to. It is definitely not even built for today's era because even today's era, requires you to start asking fundamental questions. The big thing is the illusion of knowing, is the illusion of knowing makes you feel like because you see it and you see an answer, that answer is the right one. It's not asking you, is that answer really the right one? Could there be a different answer? That is the quote unquote known things. If you reflect and think, the known unknowns probably far exceed the known knowns. But the bigger thing is the unknown unknowns. And I don't like to give credit to the person who said that, you all know. But it is a very important reflection, which is what this question brings up. I'm not even sure our PhD programs do this anymore. But when I see some of the people coming through, I'm not sure whether the curiosity, which is the essential element of it, has changed into curiosity, which is now rote, because that's what the grant writers want you to ask. They want you to have a hypothesis which is halfway proven rather than a hypothesis which says, I don't know. And I know it because I sit on and It has to do with comfort. It has to do with human comfort. We are more easy with what we like and what we are comfortable with than for knowing the unknown, especially if the unknown is stated the unknown. So I think this is a great question. The big thing here is I have no answer for it. So it's up to you to come up with the answers that you can design in such a way to foster the, for the students who are in your uh, school and class. And by the way, this is what it's fun. This is the real fun part, if you can make it happen. We have another question. Uh, ban Chong from uh, Maidon University, Thailand. Uh, well, I would like to uh, uh, ask uh, for the explanation of the, uh, the way to learn. Uh, in my childhood, I have been taught that uh, we have to stay focused, doing all these one things to learn. But actually, my kids, different for about 30 years, it's different. They can do several things at the same time and can learn very effectively. What is the explanation for that in the phenomenon? That's the first question. The second one is concentrate during the time for learning for a long period of time. But at this moment, the Gen Y, Gen, y, uh, Gen Z is very short. Uh, what is the reason behind that? Why they have a concentration time shortened? Thank you. Okay, so um, my retention for both questions may be a problem because I'm in the middle of night for me. So first question first. So the, let me answer this. Um, 
the way, have you watched your babies learn? How do they learn? They do several things. They're exploring things. The brain is built for learning that way. What we have done is created a system. And by the way, I think it's one of the other questions. The original architect in many ways, the original re-architect, because this has been done in many cultures over a period of time, the formal learning is different from the learning that happens all the time. Babies learn very fast because they have to explore the world and learn, and you don't explore it one thing at a time. You're exploring it in a more comprehensive, holistic fashion. So that's what is happening today because the attitude of sources of learning. That's why they don't go to classes. That's why they don't, they do 10 things. But are they actually focusing on 10 things? No. Your selective attention is still limited. Switch focus, yes. Could you switch focus? Yes. It's just that they choose to focus because they've got a lot of different things. And today's world is what we call push information coming at you. You're not going searching. It's coming at you all the time. It's saying this click, there's a ring, there's a sound. It says, go look. Maybe it's something new. It's probably something inane, but you go look, right? So the question is, does it actually lead to shorter attention spans? I don't know the answer to that. The people who have studied it have a very hard time demonstrating it consistently. This is probably because these things are group versus individual. Roughly 8% of kids in the US are diagnosed as attention deficit, short attention span and behavioral problems. We know that when you put medications or train them, you can reverse some of it. Okay? But 8% is a large number. Is the number of people receiving drugs gone up? The answer is yes. Is it because we find it and diagnose it earlier and better? Maybe. Or is it because we're actually building a system where you have the chance of doing that more? Don't know. The kids, by the way, both boys and girls have it, but boys are more likely to be disruptive and therefore get treated. The girls are quiet, but their attention problem are similar. We actually know a lot about these things. What we also don't know is what drives it. Lots of opinions about it. Every time technology comes in, there's a tendency to say that's the reason. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. But the data, which is quite interesting, is everything influences it. How much of the influence is such that it leads to consistent changes, don't know. And by the way, there is a processing component to it. There is a limit of how much you can pay attention to for length of time. saying whatever, because they're taping, I've got to be a little more careful. <laughs> Otherwise, I can say total nonsense, and I can be quite comfortable in saying, you ain't going to remember it. We have time for one last question. Okay. Uh, Oh, it was a great talk, and I don't remember anything from it. That's uh, perfect. <laughs> <laughs> you made my uh, point. Yes, you was <laughs> right. Getting curves don't. And I guess what I've seen in, in looking at data, uh, particularly from educational technologies, is that the learning curves, when you equate for opportunities to practice, the learning curves across individuals are, are, are quite surprisingly regular. And I'm wondering, you, you see that, that they're, they vary a lot. Are you thinking about it in terms of equating yeah, for you, opportunity? It depends on who you're studying. So if you're taking a particular grade, a group of kids of the same grade, very similar social and educational background, yes, the curves look very, very similar, provided the motivation interest factors. By the way, the curves are very different in their starting points. We starting see huge point variability different. in the starting points. Yeah. But if you control for that and control for opportunity, I mean, I think there's a positive equity measure here, right? If you give yes. kids opportunity, they will learn. They will learn. However, for certain subjects, for numeracy is where we know a lot of the data comes from, um, that you can actually show, yeah. yeah. So if you have a problem there, then your learning ability for that is a little harder. Right. Okay. So I do think also if you take kids across the spectrum, social background, for example, we look at kids with trauma, childhood trauma, their learning curve is different. Yes. Okay. What drives it? different. But, I, but on the other hand, if you do something con similar orientation, background, right. and influences, you can get it. Now, the forgetting curve is quite interesting because you can show that curve for unrelated information. If it gets linked very fast, if it gets related, the frustration techniques, 
the better the 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 slower the decrement in the rate of forgetting. Great. We actually know a lot, but applying it consistently as we just to go make you go look for the questions. Ask the questions and go learn. Thank you, Ranga, for a very interesting presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Krishnan, for a unforgettable, or would you prefer that we say a few session? May I now invite uh, NUS President Prof Tan to present tokens of appreciation to an unforgettable gentleman. So please, Prof Tan. <laughs> Now we wish to bring on stage now the very first panel of this symposium. So may I invite three panel members. The first is Ms. Suzanne Walsh. Now she is from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Secondly, Professor Toru Yoshi of Kyoto University. And thirdly, a gentleman that had We've seen earlier this morning our NUS Provost, Professor Tan Eng Chai. Now, they will take the seats here on stage. And the title of this panel is Cross Cultural Good Practices and Deployment. Of Suzanne will be moderating this discussion. So, please go ahead. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And um, a special thank you to um, Chang Huan Kun, who helped us to get organized across many time zones and many continents. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, if, if I could ask uh, our distinguished panelists, I think of this as a chat show today. These are my guests on the show. And, and I wanted to know, could I ask the audience a question before we get started? Is that okay with both of you? So one of the things that uh, we just heard from uh, Professor Krishnan, which I thought was very provocative, was he said, we all learn in the same way. The brain works in the same way. And I'm wondering, is that true or false? And what I'd love for you to do is just take a moment to talk with the person next to you about whether you think that statement is true or false and what evidence you have for that thought. I'm going to give you maybe like 30 seconds, because he said we overestimate our time. So I'll give you about 30 seconds. Okay, I don't actually know how many seconds those were, but it's close enough. Uh, what I'd like to do now is, are there a couple of people who would be brave enough to step to the microphones and tell us what you thought, if it was a true or false statement? Are there any brave people? See, in the United States, I would actually come out into the audience with the microphone and just call on you. But no? <gasps> Are you moving, sir? Oh, you're just putting your laptop down. <laughs> Come on up. Uh, hi, there, Adrian Lee from uh, NUS. Um, so we, we learned this morning that uh, uh, from from Marsha that uh, learning styles um, it, it doesn't help to teach in the learning style of the learner, but that doesn't go away from the fact that there are different learning styles, which goes to the falseness, perhaps, of the statement. Just say true. <laughs> I think we also learned you have to have evidence. <laughs> well, I, I guess the evidence the, for true is, I was just mentioning it, it was how, how surprisingly uniform the learning rate seems mm -hmm. to be when you equate for opportunity. Mm -hmm. Now, 
I, I definitely agree that there are prior knowledge variations, and those indeed will affect learning. Uh, and certainly there are abnormal situations like nutrition that can create problems. But you know, if we're, we're making an assumption about a normally functioning brain, uh, you give kids opportunities to learn, they, they will learn. The most important thing is we have to get the, them those opportunities. Okay. We have been thoroughly provoked now, both by our previous speaker and then thank you to our brave guests. And the reason that I wanted to reflect on that question for a moment is because our panel is on cross-cultural differences. And so if we actually believe that every brain is the same and everyone learns in the same way, I guess we can all go to tea break early. Um, and so what I'd like to do is just remind us of the discussion um, that we're going to have this afternoon. And, and part of it is that really this is based primarily on considerations of technology and cross-cultural learning, uh, in cross-cultural context, I should say. And I'm just going to read a little bit from um, the description that we had of this proposal, of this panel, so that you just can reground yourself. What are, what are we doing? What are we talking? These are not neutral. There's a tendency for many people to talk about technology and technology-enhanced education and to homogenize the target audience, both teachers and learners, and to overgeneralize and overassume that we all view technology and practices in the same way, and that the needs are the same, and that technology is the same, and that if introduced, everyone will somehow be able to take them and benefit from them. So some people prefer uh, technology, viewing it as having a critical role, playing a critical role in their lives. But others may not see technology uh, as providing such a useful opportunity for learning. Is there a cultural difference there? That's part of what we want to consider. But also, more importantly, teaching is by its very nature a profoundly cultural act. There's no such thing as culture-free teaching or learning. Not only is education central to most societies, Cultural norms are central to how teaching and learning are practiced and what is seen as appropriate material for students to learn. But how do we take things like we heard about earlier Asia and Australian students, how do we take those, uh, in, that information into consideration without overgeneralizing or stereotyping? That's our task today. How do we understand cultural differences, the importance that they play, if they play them at all? And how do we do that in a way that avoids us getting into those traps that we often get into? How do we move beyond stereotyping? So as you've heard, I have two distinguished guests today. And what I've asked each of them to do is to first take a moment to reflect on um, why did you even entertain this uh, opportunity to be a part of this discussion? Uh, what inspired you to accept this invitation? And then secondarily to talk, or whatever order you'd like, to talk more about the work that you do uh, in, and the work of your universities and the role that tech-enabled learning plays with faculty and students. And so I'm going to start. I am here is uh, when uh, Han Fun asked me to just say no, so uh, that's a short answer. But <laughs> Motivation is <laughs> critical to understand him. <laughs> but Han Fun is such a wonderful person and a great um, colleague. But uh, uh, I've been in Tokyo up to uh, the age of uh, 27 or 8. Then I uh, decided to go over to the United States and uh, learn in uh, as a learner. And then I uh, actually uh, started working there for uh, you know, 15, 16 years, and recently made a change uh, and, uh, uh, in my life, personal and uh, professional, and uh, decided perspective. But uh, maybe, uh, and, and I could see, I definitely uh, started seeing the Japanese perspectives from more like American perspectives, uh, perhaps. So it's kind of meta uh, you know, view of uh, you know, what I'm doing. So uh, I'm one of those uh, maybe interesting people, uh, rare people who have uh, three degrees in education technology or instruction design. Uh, my uh, dissertation, undergraduate dissertation thesis on intellectual, uh, intelligent tutoring system in the 80s. And uh, uh, then uh, I became interested in more like hypermedia, multimedia, if you, uh, you know, heard that or remember that. And that was before the internet. 
then, uh, in my last you know, 15, 20 years, I have been a, a passionate advocate for open uh, education. And this is uh, you know, so because of the internet. And uh, it's very uh, uh, interesting because uh, uh, the, I mix uh, first question and second questions. And now I'm uh, directing this center uh, for teaching and learning at, at Kyoto University. And uh, my always uh, my day-to-day -day goal is not to be hated by faculty and uh, uh, departments because you know we do a faculty development. Uh, we encourage uh, faculty members to use technology and other things they try to avoid, and also assessment of teaching and learning. Um, so it's very hard work, and I think uh, there are many colleagues here uh, in the audience who you know share the, uh, how I feel every day, too. So um, it is, uh, and also uh, I have been uh, actively engaged in what we call uh, technology-enhanced scholarship of teaching and learning, which is uh, uh, helping you know, faculty and schools uh, to uh, uh, make their good practice in teaching and uh, learning um, visible, shareable, so that we can uh, build on each other's, even going beyond the cultural differences. You know, also, um, I was very intrigued um, by these invitations of this very, uh, uh, with this very uh, you know, topic you know, here. Because we are talking about here, um, primarily I think it's just Western and uh, Asian kind of Pacific cultural you know, differences you know, here. But can we, is that, you know, is, it, is that still kind of appropriate um, valid? Uh, in faculty members or students uh, online, you know, it's offline, uh, and each school has a different uh, institutional culture. Uh, so it's a regional difference, social difference. Uh, the culture of working is also uh, uh, changing. So uh, I'm just telling that I'm very confused, and that's, that's why I'm excited you know, about this panel. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So as you can tell, we are not going to have all of the answers, but we are going to raise questions. I think that's part of, part of our job, and we learned that from our last session. So the real reason why I'm here, uh, well, Cho Chuan and I got Huang Kun to organize this, to help organize this, and she conveniently returned a favor by putting my name on this panel. <laughs> well, uh, I, I think the, for a long time, NUS has been the only and I think the role of universities, as is well known and also alluded to by Chapong in his uh, talk this morning, uh, it's really to provide uh, uh, manpower, well-trained manpower, to support the growth of the economy. And we know that uh, the world is getting to be more challenging. And uh, herein, I think, the role of universities, particularly NUS in Singapore, because uh, we know that our graduates is a much harsher world than, say, we, when we were graduates, say, 30 years ago. And uh, they, they require deep competencies in you know, their core disciplines, but on top of that, they need also a suite of other competencies, like cultural competencies, communications ability, uh, numerical uh, sort of uh, uh, numeracy and even IT literacy, right? To dim just some of this. Now, Ranga has given that good spread of seven core skills uh, mentioned just now. Um, and uh, it's really in our interest to make sure that we can really prepare all our graduates to be future ready for a world where we are really uncertain how the future will develop. Great, so what I'd like you to do is each of you is working in cross-cultural context because even if we say it's West compared with East or each reflect for a moment on um, how do you think about cross-cultural issues uh, on your campuses in terms of um, for students, how do you think about what technology is appropriate when you're thinking across cultures, and how do you think about it for faculty members as well? And I'll start with you. Mm -hmm. uh, this is, of course, a very complex uh, topic. Like what Toru has mentioned, I think it, cultural, you can be interpreted in many dimensions, right? It's not just 
the culture of the uh, learners, all right, from where they come from. Uh, it's also institutional culture. It could be also culture of, you know, uh, uh, of learning with regards to different communities, right? And uh, uh, NUS is actually quite a uh, diversified uh, learning environment in the sense that we do have students from many nationalities. Uh, and, and that's where how, how do you tailor to make sure that you know, what is effective in terms of learning outcomes. Uh, that is particularly challenging. So to, to, to just give you an example, uh, uh, we, we are predominantly quite Asian, maybe quite Confucian in the way that uh, we teach and learn. All right. And uh, the teacher plays a very central role. Right. And uh, our sense, and I guess this is also uh, verified by numerous sort of uh, surveys and focus group discussions with students that the, the, the students actually feel more comfortable if the teacher plays a more active role all right, in the teaching and learning. Right. So I think they probably are less comfortable say in an, uh, an entirely sort of, uh, say, a MOOC environment where they just do everything online. So that's why when we were trying to push uh, for uh, uh, technology-enabled learning, uh, we didn't actually adopt MOOC in the first place, but we actually adopted a blended learning fashion. We still tell the professors that that face-to-face -face contact and interaction with students is quite critical. And uh, students perhaps face, feel assured that the professor is there guiding the whole thing. So even though they are watching the videos, my like micro lectures online, all right, they are comforted that, wow, there are like still enough sessions where they meet the professors and can interact with the professor. So that influenced how we actually push technology-enhanced education in NUS. Did you actually have feedback from students when you first um, tried to implement MOOCs, or did you do an assessment of some kind? How did you make? How did you discover that this was something that students required? Uh, it's, it's a lot of experimentation. Uh, it, it, it is, in fact, uh, also true that when we first tried the blend, blended learning, uh, students are actually resistant, All right, because they are so used. For, for, I mean, for twelve years in their primary to juniors to, to, to secondary school to junior college, they are so used to the lecture-based system. All right? And if we were to suddenly change, uh, they'll be quite uncomfortable. They'll be, in fact, very uncomfortable. So we do actually find some resistance. But after a while, I think our, our colleagues who have done the flip classrooms, then you find that we get more and more supporters, uh, more and more students who will say that, yeah, I find that this is a better way of learning. Great, thank you. Thank you. Um, with your, your permission, I'd like to use uh, just a few slides. I know this is a chat show, um, but uh, so I'm not going to break the rule there. Um, we'll think of it as can, like a trailer switch, for a movie. Uh, to, uh, my, yeah. So uh, uh, just uh, get to the point, uh, you know, so you ask, um, you know, just a flown covers of two magazines, and one is a very tech-centric, you know, an education magazine. And there are a lot of people, and in, in faculty members, students, uh, we, he, you know, smartly use technology, we can improve the outcomes. You know, that's for sure. But the uh, right one is actually striking. It's, uh, uh, I think, uh, four or five years ago, the Time magazine uh, got these special issues and, like, uh, bribing kids uh, for better performance. I mean, uh, if we say, um, you know, to tell your kids uh, in the classroom, uh, you know, we can you know, award you cash, uh, you know, if you get a better score. And they didn't change, you know, any uh, uh, pedagogies, no tool, new tools, anything. And guess what? You know, pretty much all the students got a better score. So, uh, well, maybe I would this is the end of this panel, when maybe we don't need technology, but it's just a lot of cash. Um, so um, when, when I actually use technology, you know, for my students, uh, both undergraduate and graduate, you know, students, uh, actually I'm very keen to, you know, what their uh, rewards, you know, be, uh, the learning outcome, and uh, use, you know, with the use of technology, too. 
because uh, you know, I think most of you uh, not be, you know you don't need to be told. Um, again, educational technology itself, of course, doesn't make uh, educational innovation, but the, uh, the cultural context is so important. You know, here how we you know, use this uh, technology. Um, and also, uh, our, you know, we predict the future, you know, some future uh, learning and teaching. Um, but it's always our prediction is biased by our cultures and values too, right? So I want this is just for laughs. Um, you know, just 50 years ago, about half century ago, uh, I was growing up was reading this kind of a juvenile magazines in Japan. And then what they predicted, like a, a future uh, classroom, is it's a robot teachers uh, beating up kids with sticks. <laughs> and so it's very uh, powerful because they can make a lot of robots, so I think they're very personalized. Uh, so they can be personal, personalized in a way to punish um, there. And there is a MOOC like screen in a, on the, in, instead of Blackboard. So we got that done um, very nicely. Um, just IBM you know, 360 light computer you know, in here, you know, too. And again, half a century ago, you know, this is uh, Educational Information Center. Uh, they spend a lot of money you know, to teach students dog and about dog and cat, you know, something here. Um, but again, we, we're getting there, you know, learning analytics, you know, big data, and so on. And, you know, so it's a fantasy, you know, there is a flying school, of course, that's uh, atomic powered, um, you know, vehicle, flying vehicle here to uh, take students anywhere. Our current version, modern versions of that, is uh, this, you know, just launched in Japan. This is not fake. Um, this is a real high school. It's a virtual high school. And this is uh, their uh, entrance kind of ceremony, uh, you know, that's happened uh, a week ago. But <laughs> we can talk about this a lot, but better not. Um, but why, you know, they have to be in the same place? <laughs> that's my uh, question. But, you know, they can just experience virtually, you know, a lot of things, you know, something here. But again, I really like to ask all of you um, the questions, again, for what uh, purpose, with what values and, you know, cultural values and social values uh, we are bringing in. Well, oh, did yeah, you I it just make me recall uh, the, my primary school, and uh, this is ties in with uh, what Ranga was talking about motivation being the uh, the heart of learning. It, it, in my primary school, there's one teacher I remember most vividly. Uh, he's my maths teacher, Mr. Ong. <laughs> I can remember his full name even. And uh, in fact, all my classmates remember him because he goes around with a cane. He teaches mathematics, and he loves to ask questions. All right, and basically, he keeps asking questions on the simple things that you need to remember about it's very effective, because I think almost every class that he taught is about 100 or close to 100% pass. <laughs> because if you don't know, the cane comes, you know, becomes very effective. So threat, threat is actually a very important motivation. But of course, you don't see that these days. <laughs> uh, maybe that also explains why I'm a mathematician now. <laughs> I think this is not the lesson that we were hoping that people would take. It will be the only person to remember. He was caned and became a mathematics professor. Oh, I've lost total control. Um, uh, I want to bring us back, if I can, and just ask you for a second, when, uh, when primarily coming from within Asia, or are they things that you are purchasing from outside of Asia? Technology in the, that you're using in the classroom, does it come primarily from within? Well, it's very hard to say. For example, our LMS is uh, open source, for example, um, so it's actually created by, well, it could say US-centric or UK-centric, but, uh, you know, wisdom, you know, so, and uh, collaboration among all the people around the world, so, but, but uh, you know, we could say maybe Western, you know, mostly Western. And how, did you want to answer as well? Well, for, for NUS, I think we use a spread. Uh, uh, well, I guess we are quite plugged in into what is happening uh, everywhere. 
So we are also quite open to you know, adopting some of the uh, tools and technologies. Our colleagues to try to build our own tools and technologies right, to facilitate the learning of our own students. Uh, and uh, one example is, I think Ben Leong was here this morning. Are you here, Ben Leong? Yeah, so he was here this morning. Ben Leong was from computer. He actually uh, set up a gamification uh, sort of platform uh, to teach his course on C++. Uh, and that's very interesting in the sense that he makes use of the essence of games. Right. And you know games uh, introduce a lot of competition amongst the players uh, and uh, there's a hierarchy of missions that you have to accomplish uh, and every time you complete a mission you get badges, you get points. There's a leader's board which highlights maybe the top 20 amongst all the players and competition is very steep on uh, getting uh, on the leader spot and perhaps being the top, right? So he makes use of this sort of uh, essence into his uh, C++ course, right? So he divides his exercises into missions. There are some interesting observations that he saw uh, with students. The natural reaction of our students is that they will attempt the, the deadline, right? But interestingly, for those who are involved, the assignments are out. You'll find that actually students read right way downloaded. If you complete your assignments earlier, you get more points. And uh, you also allow for failures. That means you can try and try again until you complete it, right? So it's, it's quite an interesting uh, sort of uh, actually shown that uh, it has been quite successful. Uh, in fact, the, uh, 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 he had quite some good statistics. 80 to 80% of the students actually uh, uh, have found that the learning outcomes have been very much enhanced by going through this. So what he has done next is actually now to make the platform uh, available to all. Mm. Right? He's of course setting up a company for that, but he's allowing NUS to use it free for our courses. So that's one example where we develop internally uh, for our own benefit. Well, so there's a, there's a question in Pigeonhole which is about balancing the learning results. And I bring that up right at this moment because on the one hand, versus sort of Australian model, that there was a tendency for Asian students to think more at all in the example that you gave and, and also if you wanted to. Um, actually, I this is my favorite story. I think story people can remember, as uh, uh, Dr. Krishnan said. We learned a lot in that lab. Yes, and I forgot everything I should talk about here. Um, but <laughs> there was a day I stands for technology enhanced active learning. Uh, it was covered on the uh, front page of Times. Uh, in the early in the morning uh, from the president at that time, uh, Susan Hockfield. Uh, yes, Teal was mentioned, you know, covered in the uh, New York Times, yay, right? And, uh, you know, jumped into celebration mode um, there. But then the weird things happened. It's, uh, uh, the the uh, discussion forum first started with, wow, that's MIT. Is that this MIT? Is MIT? This is the future of college education, blah, 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 mm -hmm. right? Then there is a few very negative from the current MIT students who are taking that deal, of course, right? And say, this is not why my parents are paying, you know, huge, you know, very expensive uh, tuition, you know, some to MIT. You know, any, any colleges can do kind of a, uh, you know, big lecture hall, you know, n renowned uh, researchers giving, uh, you know, really uh, like, uh, you know, drinking from uh, fire hose, you know, some that's the metaphor they use, like lecture. And then actually they union, the unionized group of students actually went to the department head, the physics department, and um, begged him, uh, you know, stop doing this um, there. So uh, these are not Asian students, um, but it's a mixed, you know, some students in terms of ethnicity. And so that's how, and then 
what how MIT decided to do uh, is actually decided to keep the lecture, you know, big hall lecture version of that, uh, and also uh, of course try to improve and teal, um, you know, course. But the lesson here is all the members uh, have learned already uh, that teal it is it's working better in terms of a student's outcomes, learning outcomes. It's uh, scientifically proven, you know, it's working better than a lecture, big lecture hall. The way I too. So this is a cultural thing. And often, uh, you know, students can be very traditional and conservative uh, in, you know, selecting how they want to learn. Yeah, I, I do agree that there is a need to balance group-based learning and uh, individualistic or personalized learning. Uh, my, my sense is, at least in the NUS, uh, we, we tend to really focus a lot more on the individual-based learning rather than the group-based group learning. I think that is also perhaps uh, the way in which most of our professors were trained. Right, so we have uh, sort of good examples like what is done, being done in Duke and US where the entire curriculum is really based on team-based learning. All right, uh, but I think we're trying, uh, like for instance at our and you know in other projects to try to introduce uh, group-based learning. And it's interesting too that uh, uh, we also detect some cultural to find ways to try to mitigate that. So one example is this. Um, uh, you, you would have thought that, uh, you know, if given a choice, would you allow the students to form their own groups or you actually assign the groups? Would you, how many would say, uh, uh, allow students free choice? Our, our students are actually very... So because the group projects are graded and they want to make sure that they optimize their grades and so they will always choose the group that will help presentations writing so they would not choose. <laughs> and uh, we, we start to notice this because we know different nationalities and we know that certain national groups because they know that they are quite weak in communication skills is that please pre-assign the groups and assign the groups so that there's diversity within the groups. We also know that the student is that in the workplace, most often you don't have a chance to decide on your group. All right, you're assigned that this group go and work or you're put in this group go and work. So perhaps we are trying to simulate what is in the workplace. <laughs> That's sort of our way to try to mitigate that. Well, <laughs> these are some events. I think, so if we think about what are the cultural dimensions that are um, most important to consider in the classroom, can you identify those sorts of things? Or I'm going to keep pushing you because I'm not fully convinced that there are uh, cross-cultural challenges to even talk about because you the way that you both keep talking about some of your examples I would say we could probably identify those characteristics in each country so are there some cross-cultural um, considerations or dimensions that really must be considered would you one one is openness uh, so people in certain regions country uh, you name or well, it could be a just personal preference uh, just don't want to open up, you know, a lot of things uh, without knowing, you know, some colleagues and peers too. Uh, so the, uh, for that, I think it's very important to let those students know, uh, you know, we're creating kind of a safety zone. Uh, you know, this is it could be a seminar, you know, some class or a small group uh, where they can, you know, 
freely say anything uh, without being judged, you know, something like that. Um, I teach uh, same subject, you know, this is the future of a, uh, higher education and open education to, uh, you know, two different courses, but the very similar content, and one is taken by only Japanese students and I uh, teach in, in, in Japanese. And the other one is uh, I teach uh, uh, same similar course in English, and to uh, uh, it, uh, half of the uh, class uh, consists of uh, international students from various countries. And uh, the way they use the discussion forum is very different. They, and of course the way, and, and the, usually uh, international students dominate in class discussion and make, you know, so the Japanese students, you know, rather quiet, uh, feel, uh, you know, we are inferior. Um, you know, to you know, some these Western or international students. So I encourage them to say whatever you know with their frustrations, not be able to speak out uh, online. So they carefully consider th some of the good uh, writing comment, you know, written comments on discussion from from Japanese students, and then have seen um, you know this uh, uh, in class discussion also uh, becoming very uh, virulent. Uh, among, you know, among Japanese students as well, too. So, you know, it's using, I think it's a very effective way of using discussion for um, this uh, asynchronous, you know, some kind of nature. Students in mind, I mean, if the discussion forum isn't a natural place that, uh, that they feel confident to, to speak out in, and so it's, or safe, and yet you've figured out a sort of a workaround. And I'm wondering if that, is that the way that we tend to operate in general in higher education now, which is if there's a technology that doesn't quite fit this context, do you figure out a work? It's, it's, it's a really, um, it's a very great point. Um, so we have to think about whether we, uh, the culture's uh, technology, or we use technology to change cultures. I think many of you may be, you know, you have in a new culture of learning by uh, John Seeley Brown um, and uh, uh, Douglas Thomas. And so I mean, we are changing um, teaching cultures and learning cultures, but also there are uh, maybe some cultures, you know, regional, local culture we want to preserve and, you know, use technology on top, you know, some of those things. So uh, that's our choice, uh, you know, each of our, you know, our choice, you know, customize technology or use, you know, customize the use of technology within certain culture, you know, so of teaching and learning, or we rather want to use technology as a change agent, um, you know, for cultural uh, innovation or uh, changing cultures. Well, I agree. I think there are various stages and it really depends on the majority of the users and the learners. Mm -hmm. All right. So sometimes you need to find the right tools to bring up the, the, learn, the, the group of learners and the group of teachers All right, to one level before you can proceed with the next level. But I think what, what is important is really that you must... Uh, have very good evidence to show that you know you are doing the right things, and not just blindly just use it for the sake of well because somebody has invested in that or somebody asked you to use it. So you really have to keep uh, very close attention on what are the outcomes, and are these really the outcomes that you are targeting for before you go on. And again, when you are measuring and keeping track of this, you can refine your approach as you go along. So um, and you started out by saying that you have sort of a Confucian approach to, uh, to teaching and learning um, at NUS. Could you say a little bit more about why is that important cultural context for, for our, us to understand? Or if I were developing a technology, what, what would be used at NUS? Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure whether it's so much about the technology, uh, but it, it's just, just a thinking that you know, the teacher in class and uh, what the teacher is the expert and what comes from the teacher is correct. All right? And that, although I think it's very helpful, and also uh, education is extremely important. You need uh, to go through education to be a scholar and then you'll be respected. Right. And that ties in quite well with the society that you know, the education 
is a basis for which you can actually secure a good career. Right? So th these are all, all the essence of that Confucian thinking. Uh, but again, there are some sort of, uh, uh, in the, sort of the, the typical sort of Asian class, uh, our students tend to ask less questions. They tend to be less questioning. Right. Whereas we know from Ranga that it's very important to interrogate the knowledge so that you can remember. All right. And then you can also be creative if you do that. So what we are able to get that knowledge level, but to go to the next level of creativity and to be innovative. I think that, that part about changing our culture, I think that's quite important. Uh, I like the technology needs to be uh, uh, designed uh, modularizable and also uh, uh, customizable. That's very important. Uh, meaning that uh, you know, even the same uh, uh, learning goal or a set of learning goals, uh, the uh, tools um, or platforms uh, need to uh, ensure there will be a multiple designs and paths uh, you know, can be taken to get there. And it could be a cultural, you know, something. Uh, you know, could could be a group, uh, you know, kind of path or. In, um, but that's part. And again, I'm, I don't know if this is like a Western versus, you know, West versus East um, kind of argument or not. Because you know, I have both in myself, for example, you know, Western part of kind of myself and Asian part of my, you know, some self too. So I think it's uh, becoming increasingly confusing, and I th I'm afraid it's a bit kind of a stereotypical uh, these days. Uh, I think the younger generations and the kids, you know, my, uh, you know, 10 years, 11 years old, uh, immersing himself in like, a, uh, you know, some Minecraft and, uh, uh, you know, that kind of stuff. And, you know, she's already living in, a, in that kind of, grow, you know, globalized world. So that cultural difference really doesn't mean much uh, sometimes to him. Question um, from Pigeonhole, is commonalities between cultures better than teaching based on differences? And I think part of what I'm here, and I think this is why the order of, of the session has built on the previous session. And I, it sounds like we keep coming back really to core questions about teaching and learning more than we do about cultural differences. But does either one of you have um, a comment on this particular question? Probably both. All right. And uh, if I'll give you an example. When uh, we started our communications and writing courses, all right, 6,000 students every year, right? And the natural way will be to let the courses, right? But uh, we made the observation that uh, it's actually better to run the courses differently. Uh, and uh, if you put a class of engineers and teach them writing and communications, is it social scientists, humanities students? Uh, in fact, I think you will agree. And that's where you, know, you, you have that differences, but that differences is a strength by itself. Right? And uh, we start thinking that where can we have that show colleges or residential halls? This is where, you know, we have students of all disciplines. In fact, different seniorities, different nationalities actually living together. So we offered our, in fact, we are in the process of making sure that all our writing and communication courses are actually offered at these platforms rather than in the faculty because we find that the learning outcomes is much more severe superior if you actually offer them in this. We leverage on teaching based on differences, right? And there are actually many examples that we come to realize that the diversity of that student mix in the class, actually there's tremendous learning that you can actually get from them. But I don't think we fully exploited that. Um, 
Japanese graduates are being heavily criticized. Um, it's not really well structured. It's it's a kind of small you know system. Uh, I think perhaps started from your you know learned from European uh, system um, you know a long time ago, um, but you know learn from your master uh, you know tac tacit knowledge right um, by modeling and you know whatever you know some learn uh, day by day uh, participating in some research um, you know experiments and and so on. So they prefer that kind of way uh, than kind of a well-structured, uh, bottom-up kind of uh, curriculum, you know, so, or program. So it's more like kind of Jedi, you know, Star Wars kind of Jedi, you know, Jedi didn't go to schools uh, to become a Jedi. <laughs> but but, uh, uh, but then, then coming back to technology question, how, you know, current, uh, you know, LMS or other tools uh, basically were built you know, to support more kind of a structured, uh, systematic approach, you know, sort of teaching and learning. So, uh, but this kind of analog, you know, old-fashioned, um, but kind of a art, the way artists, you know, some learn from their masters, um, how we could support, you know, some this kind of uh, teaching and learning style uh, with technology. So that's, you know, huge issue. It's, again, it's not Western versus Eastern, but, but uh, I think it's definitely, uh, you know, that kind of more systematic there. So I'd like to ask, I know we have universities from across Asia. We have our guests from um, Germany as well. I'd love for some of you to, who would be willing, you can either use um, pigeonhole or you can use um, the microphone. Or is it really just sort of an earning that we have to take into consideration? Go ahead. So I, this is a very practical very practical thing or consideration, but I think it's real and it's worth putting out there. Um, different cultures have different, uh, different schedules, different calendars. They have different uh, you know, national holidays, religious holidays that would dominate a student's life. There are things that if I, a, as a uh, Western faculty member, was designing an online course that I knew was gonna be taken across the globe, it would be helpful those considerations should be, and it would be helpful for a group like this to come together and outline those types of considerations that should be made. So at least in the context of actual design and deployment, which I think was part of the topic, uh, I would insist that there has to be at least a practical, a certain number of practical considerations that have to be made. Any other? We'd love to hear from some of the other universities who are from other Asian countries or our colleagues from Europe. Am I also learning that I shouldn't be calling on individuals? I'm trying to remember what my cross-cultural. Okay, I'm going to ask, I'm going to ask uh, while you all are thinking, uh, I wanted to ask both of you. So we started to make sort of a list of things. I'm going to take this from the perspective of if, if a company or if an institution wants to design technology that can be used in a global context, because that's the reality of most technology today is used in a global context, um, what are the things that they should be thinking about? So part of our list so far is that, you know, we have to set some common learning goals or outcomes that the technology has to be modulizable, I think is what you said. So it has to, you have to be able to use it in modules. It has to be customizable. And you have to have multiple design paths. Are there any other things that we would add if you're trying to think about what do you do in a, in a cross-cultural, if you are thinking about technology that's going to be used from Singapore Management University. Actually, um, I would like to share my perspectives and invite for more thoughts on it. I don't think it's more about um, you know, cross-cultural as in Asian and Western. We're talking about globalization. A uh, lot of the companies that are technology companies are held, you know, uh, senior positions are held by Asians, and a lot of the workers are contributing to that and in, in the same way. You know? so, um, but I think we could perhaps take a look, a different perspective of um, universities that have been for uh, a longer period of time. 
uh, whereas uh, SMU, SUTD, SIT has. I think the way we use technology enable learning in these universities will differ because we have started at different time points. NUS has probably started with a lot more traditional systems and then now they have to adapt. Whereas young universities, um, we, we are you know, very well in spaces. You know, we, when we started up, things were different. So um, I would like to invite thoughts from the panel members on how a traditional university um, and a young university might be different in adopting technology-enabled learning. Thank you. Thank you. Does either one of you want? And I think it relates to the question from, from Pigeonhole as well about as generations evolve. So it's generations of institutions evolve, but also generations of. Uh, becoming in a more uh, important, in a, I would say, not just do everything or provide everything you know, by yourself. Uh, as a young, you know, the university, uh, and that's actually the first things I teach, uh, you know, to our students and graduate students at Kyoto University. It doesn't mean to don't rely on your uh, local faculty members, local teachers, but there are a lot out there already, you know, in terms of uh, education uh, resources. So uh, a kind of a peer-to-peer -peer kind of learning community to use that in addition to what you can get locally here. And you know that to some extent. But the toughest part is the faculty members. Uh, never look at, this is a faculty development you know, challenges and uh, you know, they never really look at what other you know, uh, instructors are teaching, how they're teaching. One way it is to have students uh, teach and not mimicking you know, you know, something like that. So if we say we're going to change your, you know, your teaching culture, <laughs> they never listen and they disappear. Um, but again, you know, have to and you know, sit back so stu uh, faculty members can sit back and watch, observe, learn from their students how we could do that kind of thing as institutions. That's a trick. Well, I. I guess if you are a young university, uh, maybe, and of course you can argue that if you're old, you're old or traditional universities, uh, you also have other constraints and structures that you have to worry about. But I guess the situation right now is that uh, the world moves very fast, right? And uh, all universities, whether, and I think the expectation is that uh, you have to respond, all right, where you have access to many of these tools. Uh, I think you're probably pretty much on equal full advantages. The old universities, the traditional universities may have already a system. Another question. Um, so still, uh, the NUS example amendable to use of technology. So our first interest is to make sure that, you know, at the very least, try using technology. Right, and we may not in one sort of uh, crisis. Uh, we were afraid that you would turn into a SAR. Uh, that was the time where we declared that no classes for that one who use the internet. All right, to continue, all right, delivering your courses, prepare their PowerPoint, you know, slides, and then put it on the web. But of course, we try to encourage the professors. We send matches, messages, subtle and otherwise, that maybe PowerPoint is not good enough. <laughs> the, my colleagues and me personally actually went through what was uploaded onto our, our sort of learning management system. All right. And we can actually see the improvement all right, over the years. So ever since 2009, when we started e-learning, we have e-learning every year, just one week every year. Web. available on the net, all right, and uh, to enhance their lecture. I think that's a sort of a level that you hope to bring your professors and you can push more. Right? So that's just one example on how we can do it. And we can do it because uh, we have that system in place to enable us to do it. It's just how... Uh, maybe before you ask... ...involving... Uh, uh, there has already been a lot of research done, but lots more research needs to be done, particularly for learning. Mm -hmm. 
And uh, we, we are hoping the experts will come together and to extract some very good sound principles that can help guide Singapore and the world you know, in the design of such courses. Mm -hmm. We know it's useful, right? but we want to be more refined to know what exactly is useful. What makes Japan well, special? Well, it's, well, there are a lot more specials in 80s and 90s, maybe. Um, but again, we are, as you all know, uh, are trying to reach um, at many different levels, you know, government, industries, and education, which is the hardest, you know, I think. We should keep you know, our cultures you know, so in education. Uh, we don't want to lose, probably. But it's, you know, we could uh, keep adding on some other, you know, some values and dimensions to what we have. Uh, it's all networked in this world and the networked working environment, right? And uh, uh, Japan has been good, um, like making car, you know, Walkmans, but those all like uh, independent you know, individual pro products not, you know, being connected. So, you know, it's kind of a master hand, you know, who could design something for individual users, you know, so that's good. Uh, rice cooker, you know, it's not network, maybe it will be uh, network, <laughs> but, uh, thinking, you know, we start, you know, thinking. Um, you know, whether, and again, that's, you know, what we try to change, you know, so help, you know, like, not TPP, you know, here, but again, higher education is in the kind of same phase, um, the TPP opening up and free trade, in you know, of knowledge, students, faculty, and each institution is really struggling to uh, find out a way to survive, you know, some there, uh, and students um, too, and the faculty members not that struggling, they're just latecomer and they just are not aware of uh, how uh, at risk, you know, some they are. I, I think, uh, because nobody talk about the robot teachers much, uh, in a <laughs> but can be sub you know, so the real teachers can be you know, substituted you know, some by those good online courses. So I would like to think that, um, that Professor Tan actually just challenged me back on is to say, well, I thought that was for the GLC to figure out. So I, I would also encourage you, if there are a set of questions around cross-cultural issues or a set of ideas that you think are important for us to explore as a council, I would also encourage you to, to get in line and to share those. So, so there's an interesting analogy to think about, which is medicine. Medicine has deep cultural differences at one level, and if you go back centuries, it was unrecognizable from one culture to another how medicine was thought about in practice. Current of real science around what underpins and difficulties that is becoming increasingly global, and and so you know you wouldn't want to treat a tree just because of cultural reasons. You, you want to benefit from the modern understanding of diseases and treatments and so forth globally, but you also don't lose the cultural sensitivities and differences between how you deal with disease and its impact on families and individuals and all that. So is there something similar around education where th there's a, a growing amount of learning science building up that would suggest students sitting as recorders anywhere in the world because it really doesn't work well except for somehow the most already prepared students who are doing all the practice in their head doing it, that we must make learning environments be places that produce real work. And then we have to figure out, so how does that look different culture by culture? As opposed to saying, well, if a culture doesn't want to be active, then we shouldn't make it be active. Is there some analogy in this? Um, thank you. It's very thoughtful. And, uh, but I, I always think um, the medicine is to cure, you know. And uh, it means, so you can say, okay, I'm a doctor, you're perfectly cured, so you're good to go. It's almost like building excuse me, you know, my uh, metaphor here is that's a building different kinds of cyborg, um, you know, in terms 
uh, have different kind of skill set. Uh, or otherwise, everybody's going to be like a robot. You know, so like Joe Ito, uh, somebody quoted uh, Joe Ito, um, you know, mentioned just if students become more like robots, you know, they're going to lose jobs. Um, but so how we could, um, it's add-ons very important, you know, for education these days. Not like, so medicine is again, uh, you know, how doctors uh, treat uh, patients. Uh, of course, there is a cultural kind of ways of doing this uh, and uh, based on the family circumstances and everything. And of course, teachers have to think about too. But in terms of uh, what learners need to, people need to learn, continue, you know, to learn and gain, you know, skills and knowledge, I think it's very different from the purpose of medicine. Um, it's, it's again, it's curing, so I'm uh, getting people back to zero, I mean, from the ne negative kind of a stage. Uh, whether, uh, you know, we're starting from zero, and maybe uh, there are some uh, studying from negative, you know, some uh, point, uh, some learners are. But again, how much they can gain, I have agreed, innocent to your point and analogy, I think that's great, but I think we are living in very different kind of uh, age, uh, in, you know, it's no longer in that it will be a happy society if everybody can, you know, run, you know, write, read, and uh, you know, calculate something. Um, so I think it's no longer a core thing here. Hi, thank you, I'm Nancy Gleason, Yale and U.S. College. Thank you for this very interesting talk today. Um, my question pertains to gender, actually, um, and the ways in which perhaps we could consider technology as a tool for addressing gender gap uh, under cultural differences amongst female learners in the context of a co-ed classroom um, and the potential of technology to address um, differences there, cultural differences. Um, I'm thinking specifically of cases in which um, my female students might not want to speak up as much as my male students, but I can use technology for a discussion forum and then the questions come um, but maybe there's a more broad-based, um, that's a very anecdotal thing, so I'm looking for more broad-based um, feedback there or considerations, or perhaps it's... I like that that could be the end of every question, or maybe the GLC can figure that out. <laughs> I'm writing... A uh, ...difference uh, stereotype, but uh, Asian, you know, ladies are more quiet and not that social, and maybe that's changing radically. Uh, it depends on... Everything. Also trying to figure out with what you talked about earlier in terms of your students are challenged, your Japanese students are not as engaged in the discussion forum. So are you at NUS, did you say? Yale and US. And so I'm just, I'm trying to, now I'm trying to match that point and then, I'm, and then you're adding gender onto that. That's, that's, a, that's a lot to ask and to think about. But um, I think, and is, is Justine still here? Justine can probably probably has opinions or answers to this as well from, from Carnegie Mellon, but I think just question. Olivia, or is it Oliver? Well, usually it's Oliver, so oh, I'm oh. happy to hear new <laughs> variations of it. So yeah, I'm from Berlin, as mentioned, uh, the, the Europe, Texas and California. Um, how is the situation uh, in Germany with the different states? and sometimes me, maybe even the uh, different institutions within a state. Uh, and there's the common joke that a uh, professor might uh, be more willing to share a toothbrush but uh, the same text materials for a class. Um, engage professors to collaboratively uh, work together, which is very common in research as we all know. But when it comes to teaching, I still feel we, uh, we lack of uh, many good examples. Maybe there are a few. We have uh, acknowledged that uh, also internationally uh, from Germany. But I do feel for the um, Global Learning Council, this could be a very interesting uh, topic. And uh, from our perception, it's a question about incentives. So if you um, take into account how much work it is, if you take into account how much more difficult it is maybe uh, across uh, countries to work together, um, then it maybe needs a real policy side, then maybe it needs a real uh, leadership 
um, to engage professors to go onto that road and to make new experiences and then maybe to also have the benefit from it. So in Bavaria we see that for some years that uh, professors from different uh, universities who are ready to do that, they get a, a certain amount of support, they get some resources, and this is working quite well for the state. Um, so maybe this is uh, further to uh, explore. The last um, uh, reference in terms of uh, when you ask about uh, cultural um, or uh, different uh, countries, um, where's the capacity building aspect? Is it really supportive for the, the um, institution in Africa to have the up their capacity. So I think it's not easy to answer it in all cases, but I do thank you all so much and thank you for the quite we didn't get to all of the questions, some of which were about teaching and learning, which were a bit beyond uh, our scope for today. Um, but I wanted to, to um, thank both the format. It's really important to have this, the same learning goals and outcomes identified. You have to be able to use it in a modular fashion. It should be customizable. There should be multiple paths to the design and that it should be open and that it should be practical. We need practical information to understand those cross-cultural differences. So I want to thank both of my guests today and thank you all for your participation. Thank you very much. Okay, this is a truly cross-cultural panel experience. I mean, we have three uh, truly global citizens, but with deep expertise and experience three different cultural contexts, eh? Japan, Singapore, and USA. So really a wonderful opportunity to hear. Now we'd like to invite our president, Professor Tan Cho Chuan, up on stage to present three tokens of appreciation to, of course, all three panelists. So first up for Ms. Suzanne Walsh. Suzanne, thank you very much. Secondly, Prof. Yoshi. Prof. Yoshi. Of course, last but not least. Mr. Ong, right? So Professor Tan and Chai. And let's also have a group photo with yes, let's have a group photo with the president and all three panelists. Great, wonderful, thank you. Now we adjourn for afternoon tea. Now please remember that some of the technology, still have the technology demonstration, so please avail yourself to that. We come back to the tea and the technology demonstrations and see you later. Thank you.